Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dionis Dimitrakopoulos. I am um, the uh, holder of the Jean Monnet Chair in Parliamentary Democracy and European Integration here at Birkbeck, the first one in Birkbeck's uh, history. And I would like to welcome everyone to this inaugural event, which marks the beginning of a lengthy process full of events, including one that we will have um, on Thursday. The purpose of the Jean Monnet Chair is to deepen and enhance teaching uh, and research on the European Union at Birkbeck, but also to build a bridge, as today's event demonstrates, to civil society as well as policymakers in an effort to bring policy making and decision making on the EU much closer to uh, uh, ordinary citizens and to shed light on this novel uh, institution. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome uh, Emily O'Reilly, who's the European Ombudsman, as the inaugural uh, lecturer uh, in this series of events. It is uh, a genuine pleasure because um, Emily O'Reilly, as I wrote to her when I invited her to the event, uh, has done a hell of a lot uh, since 2013, which is when she took office. Uh, in order to protect the European Union, which is an emerging and evolving polity, from the dangers, some of the dangers that a lot of parliamentary democracies face in um, uh, these days. And um, it is customary when we invite prominent speakers to praise them uh, in order to justify uh, the, our choice. In this particular case, I do not need to do so because Emily O'Reilly's work speaks uh, much louder than I could. I could mention the battles that she, had, that she has fought and she's fighting in terms of revolving doors and the problem that exists in that respect at the European level, but also at the national level, as many of you would know. I could mention um, uh, how she reacted to uh, the so-called Selmayr Gate, and I could also mention the um, fight that she's uh, carrying out at the moment in terms of seeking to uh, inject a greater degree of transparency in the Council of Ministers of the EU, which is one of the most important institutions of the EU, as many of you will know. Uh, now, I'm pleased to welcome her as the inaugural uh, lecturer uh, in this series of events. Uh, she will speak for about 20 minutes. And then uh, she will take uh, questions, but please, first of all, keep your microphones off and type the questions you have in the chat facility which exists on the right-hand side of your screen. I will pick some of them. I'm pleased to say there are more than 80 uh, individuals present. I will pick uh, some of them and relay them to our speaker. Without further ado, Emily O'Reilly, thank you. Thank you very much indeed and um, thank you for that lovely and very generous welcome. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening for this inaugural event and I'd like to begin by congratulating you on the awarding to you of the Jean Monnet Chair uh, late last year. To receive it is always an honour but to receive it at this historical juncture in the relationship between the UK and the EU I think gives it a particular salience. So I'm sure it's possible that many in this audience were unaware of the Office of the European Ombudsman before this evening's invitation popped into your emails. In broad terms, I fulfill the same role as a UK or a member state Ombudsman does. I take complaints from citizens who feel that they've been badly treated by the administration, in my case, the EU administration, and attempt to resolve them. Complaints can range from freedom of information refusals, problems with contracts and grants, the handling of infringement allegations, uh, fundamental rights issues, ethical issues such as conflicts of interest and revolving door cases, which you mentioned in your introduction, the transparency of the EU's decision-making process, and issues around EU staff complaints and recruitment. If I find maladministration, I make recommendations for redress or suggestions for improvements in their service. Most complaints are against the Commission because of its size and executive reach, but my mandate also covers bodies such as the European Central Bank, 
the European Medicines Agency, the European Investment Bank, all three of whom are currently significant players, as you know, in the EU's management of the COVID pandemic. Ombudsman, therefore, trade in the world of accountability. And while that is commonly understood as the need for an administration to account for and take responsibility for its actions, the word has a particular resonance when it comes to the European Union. A resonance probably best summed up in the much quoted apocryphal phrase attributed to Henry Kissinger, who do I call if I want to call Europe? Now, it is said that it is rare in Brussels for a seminar to be held without that quote being trotted out, despite many attempts over the years to deny that Kissinger actually ever uttered it. In 2009, Reginald Dale of the Center for uh, Strategic Studies in Washington told the Financial Times, Kissinger never made the famous remark about Europe's telephone number. According to the late Peter Rodman, who knew him well, the saying is apocryphal. And in fact, Kissinger's concern was the precise opposite. He was fed up with having to deal with a Dane whom he regarded as incompetent and ineffective, who was trying to represent the whole of the EU as president of the council. Kissinger himself has disowned the remark and it seems that he was actually seeking to divide and rule in Europe rather than be restricted to a single voice on the telephone, close quotes. The remark, made or not made, nonetheless retains its value. The Treaty of Rome is now over 60 years old, yet the question of who is in charge, who is accountable, who indeed do you call if you want to call Europe, remains both contested and unsettled, just as the ultimate destination of the EU itself does. Ownership of, approval for, and therefore accountability for EU initiatives is multi-layered. The European Commission recently, for example, unveiled a massive post-COVID recovery fund, which most EU citizens assume is now a done deal. Given that every head of the EU member states, the European Council, endorsed it after weeks of rather tense haggling. Nonetheless, both Commission President von der Leyen and Council President Michel have now had to come out to plead with the parliaments of the 20 member states who have yet to ratify it to do so as a matter of urgency. But if diplomatic niceties and hierarchies were set aside, who would Kissinger call? German Chancellor Angela Merkel or Commission President Ursula von der Leyen? European Council President Charles Michel? The new Italian Prime Minister and former ECB head Mario Draghi? or European Parliament President David Sassoli. The power balance constantly shifts, either deliberately or inevitably. A powerful German Chancellor can trump the Commission President. Small member states can form alliances strong enough to trump the big ones. A boxing clever Parliament can outwit the Council, while the actions of an altogether different body, such as the ECB, can make and have executed decisions that have profound implications for the State of the Union. Mario Draghi's whatever it takes speech during the financial crisis is regarded as the game-changing moment of the EU's response. In a union without an agreed end game, power in one sense is always up for grabs, or perhaps like mercury slithering across a table, it is theoretically always within reach, but remains like accountability elusive. When I was first elected as European Ombudsman in 2013, the memory of the Troika was still very sharply etched in the minds of EU citizens who had felt its power and reach. Some of those citizens approached me looking for someone to blame, someone to be democratically accountable for the measures imposed by their governments, but essentially on the orders of the Troika as they perceived it. They told of hollowed out health services, of lost jobs, of basic services denied and wanted to know who could account to them for what they had suffered. I had to explain that in an accountability sense, the Troika simply did not exist. It was not an EU body, but rather a group comprising the Commission, the ECB and the IMF, not directly collectively accountable to anyone. Furthermore, it was the Eurozone finance ministers who were essentially in control representing, in their eyes, their own taxpayers. I could deal with specific complaints against the Commission or the ECB, 
But what citizen could possibly disentangle the Troika's work to a point where that would be possible? The recent row over the vaccine contracts also demonstrated the accountability conundrum. While the Commission held its hands up for certain clumsy actions, it was also the representatives of the member states who were very much involved in every stage of the vaccine procurement. That is not to deny the significant role of the Commission in the planning and indeed in the legal detail. But why heap blame on the Commission alone when, behind the scenes, it is the member states who are squabbling about price and indemnity and even perhaps about the choice of vaccines on which to place their bets. Where does accountability lie in that scenario? Citizen confusion isn't helped either by the identical titles that the EU gives to its leaders, leading to an administration awash with presidents and a citizenry largely puzzled as to their respective decision-making rules, assuming even that the power distribution remains static over time. So we have the President of the Commission, the President of the Parliament, the President of the European Council, in addition to a six-month rotating presidency of the Council. We also have presidents of the Committee of the Regions and of the Economic and Social Committee. Then we have presidents of the ECB, the EIB, and even a president of the Court of Justice. The rotating Council is not to be, but often is, confused with the European Council. The latter body comprises the heads of state and governments of the EU, while the Council comprises member state ministers. The Council of Europe here in Strasbourg also has a president, plus a six-month rotating presidency of the Council itself. And while that is a completely separate body to the EU, many citizens probably think it is not. I will leave aside citizen and indeed media and political confusion around the European Court of Justice an EU body, and the European Court of Human Rights, a Council of Europe body, which has, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, while, while noting that the failure to distinguish between the two did play a role in the Brexit propaganda wars with the rulings of the ECHR, at times confused with those of the ECJ. In terms of EU lawmaking, the relative powers of the three big institutions seems on the surface straightforward. The Commission proposes legislation and the co-legislators, the Parliament and the Council, then agree or disagree to adopt them, with or without amendments, although usually with. But while the Commission's proposals are understood to be drawn from the broad policy direction drawn up by the heads of state and government, the European Council, both the current von der Leyen Commission and the Juncker Commission, which preceded it, have very self-consciously described themselves as political commissions and I'm not sure that anyone is entirely clear as to what that actually means. The jockeying for political centre stage, to be the one perhaps to lift the phone should Mr Kissinger ring, was on full display in recent months when no one could initially agree on who should chair the proposed conference on the future of Europe. No one could agree either on what the conference is intended to achieve, but for the moment, political noise is confined to a row over who presides. The Council did not endorse the Parliament's preferred candidate, and names floated by the Council did not appear to endear themselves to the MEPs. So in the end, Solomon-like, it was agreed that all three presidents of the institutions should share the role, and that is where it currently stands. So my role amid all of this is to act as a bridge between the EU citizen and to give practical life to the exercising of rights granted to the newly created European citizen following the Maastricht Treaty. As ever, trying to make an institution that is common across Europe to sit on all fours with the much more complex political and administrative structure of the EU has its challenges. In general, the work is straightforward, but at times accountability is elusive, with hot potato items tossed between the institutions as my office tries to pin down somebody or some institution for an answer. The Commission may, for example, hold certain documents on a sensitive issue, such as fishing quotas, to take a recent case. But if a member state or member states, i.e. the Council, object to their release, the Commission will not release them. The ECJ might take a different view, but few citizens are likely to take that route. And unlike in the UK and Ireland, there is no information commissioner to act as an independent arbiter and enforce binding decisions. 
The answers, therefore, to the normal type of ombudsman question, who took a decision, who made a mistake, who is responsible, who do I hold to account, aren't always clear. Or the real answer in many cases, it was the member states, is, really, is rarely satisfactory. If, for example, it was Ireland behind closed doors in the council who objected to a particular uh, who blocked a proposal along with some allies that French citizens would have supported. How could those French citizens possibly hold Ireland to account or even find out that it was in fact Ireland that blocked the move or find out that it was their own country who failed to win the argument? The public interest, according to the Council, is usually best served by protecting the deliberative process, even if that deliberative process goes on for a decade or more. In many cases, they simply stop deliberating at all, neither agreeing to nor rejecting a proposal, confident that most citizens will be oblivious. But the question of EU accountability, who does what and who is accountable, took on a particular urgency when the pandemic hit. Panicked citizens looked not just to their own governments, but also to the EU to provide help and protection. The fact that member states have historically not ceded control of public health to the EU to allow it to become an EU competence uh, was, sorry, was probably, sorry, excuse me, I just lost my place there. Um, uh, sorry, to allow it to become an EU competence is probably not widely understood by citizens, but the consequences of that power asymmetry soon became very clear. Last July, my office launched a series of inquiries and initiatives looking at various aspects of the response of the different EU institutions and agencies. We worked with the European Commission, the Council, the European Investment Bank, the European Medicines Agency, and the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC. We urged transparency in how they operated, and particularly at a time when citizen trust was a very valued yet fragile commodity. In recent weeks, we have received complaints in relation to the publication of the vaccine contracts. And while the cases are still ongoing, the issue took on a fresh dimension when the Commission got into a row with and demanded transparency from one of the vaccine manufacturers and part published the contract along with two others. We haven't yet finished the case, but what's interesting is that in the middle of all of this, uh, when the row occurred, uh, the Commission suddenly discovered the value of transparency and part released the documents, even though the, the issues around the public interest, which should have encouraged it to release the, the, um, to release the contract earlier, had not, been taken, had not been taken up by it. But amid that larger scale investigation, I opened a major inquiry into how the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control gathers and assesses data to enable it to do what its title says it is supposed to do, prevent and control disease. The centre, based in Stockholm, was set up after the SARS outbreak of 2002. And it's worth mentioning that approximately 30 people in Europe actually caught that virus with just a single death. But that small fight, however, was sufficient to give political support to the setting up of a quasi EU health agency but not sufficient enough to give it the powers it needed to actually do the job. It gave the EU a handhold on a small sliver of health competence, but within the small print, multiple reassurances to the member states that there would be absolutely no threat to their national competences. Cake and eating it, to quote the British Prime Minister on another matter. It was and continues to be the member states who control the data type with the ECDC given no independent powers to find out how prepared the EU was should the big crisis happen, and preferably long before the big crisis actually did happen. So this small EU agency with a big title suddenly found itself in charge of advising on matters, not just at the heart of public safety, but also of national sovereignty. The crisis would consequently expose the inbuilt fault lines of its design. So as the pandemic hit and the EU struggled to exert a type of central control to avoid free-for-all, national authorities struggled to report complete data to the ECDC or did not even answer its appeals for data. 
it, DCDC did not have a comprehensive data set on hospital testing or other medical capacity, precisely what it should have had in its bottom drawer, not just to make assessments and give advice during the pandemic, but data which could have helped build member state and therefore EU resilience long before the emergency began. Our investigation helped explain all of this to a wider audience. We made general remarks about the need for greater transparency and for public explanations of its statements and advices. But we also highlighted for the legislators that in the absence of meaningful powers, the ECDC and therefore the EU will struggle to get on top of similar crises. Crises that respect neither national sovereignty nor the competing competences of EU institutions. Some might observe that that was entirely the political point of the ECDC from its very creation. Establish the simulacrum of an EU body, wait for a crisis, point to the need for the simulacrum to become real, i.e. to draw slightly more powers in its direction, better to protect citizens, thus strengthening the EU's role in a vital arena of public policy. The Commission is currently ploughing ahead with plans for a so-called health union. Whether the member states will play ball remains an open question, although the size of the fight this time around may resolve that issue. Indeed, some might see in this matter shades of another apocryphal and widely used claim that Jean Monnet said that Europe was a super state being created by stealth, incremental steps disguised as for a particular and rational purpose but with a fundamental and different ultimate purpose. That false quote has been widely used by Eurosceptics for obvious reasons, but in its more benign essence, Jean Monnet's drive to find solutions that are effective is now well acknowledged. And he did say in 1974, and I quote, the problems that our countries need to sort out are not the same as in 1950, but the method remains the same. A transfer of power to common institutions majority rule and a common approach to finding a solution to problems are the only answer in our current state of crisis." Close quotes. Monet would probably regard the current crisis as an obvious example of the need for current institutions when the non-common ones have failed to prove their effectiveness. But whatever the subterranean long-term aspirations, the investigation and indeed the crisis itself demonstrated the current role of the member states in the workings of the ECDC, its own lack of useful independence, precisely because of the member states stranglehold on its autonomy. That disentangling of the decision making of the EU administration, pointing out that Brussels is actually not a faceless bureaucrat, but rather a leader with a well known face in Paris and Madrid and Bratislava and Dublin, etc, is a significant part of my work. I should point out, nonetheless, that despite the Tower of Babel approach to decision-making and to its communication, the EU still wins substantial public approval for its leaders and for its institutions. For some reason, possibly best addressed by you, the academics, the EU insists on declining to obey the will of what your PM might describe as the doomsters and the gloomsters, and continues to progress in the face of, some might say because of, the serial crises that befall it hanging together remains the, the, the best option. I sometimes wonder when I'm thinking about this, if, if the late Mr. Monet had not become a sort of EU whisperer, his spirit descending incognito, just when the tumbrils appear to be rattling for the EU. A recent documentary by French Public TV gave a fly on the wall look at two critical meetings of the European Council last year. The second one concerned the COVID recovery funds and the dramatic tension was provided by the clash between the so-called frugals, i.e. the countries concerned about the volume of funding and how it might be used, and others who were urging both generosity and speed. In the end, the editorial line was that the frugals were deemed to have lost the argument. In interviews after the climb down, both the Austrian Chancellor and the Dutch Prime Minister looked slightly bemused by what had occurred, as if they had indeed been taken over by a force outside of their control, perhaps indeed by the spirit of the late Mr. Monet. Last November, the Pew Research Centre, the Institute for Global Opinion Polling, 
found high levels of support for the EU, a finding backed by a recent Eurobarometer report. But while 71% of Europeans are either fully or partly in favour of the European Union, nearly half of Europeans are not in favour of how the European Union has been realised so far. The poll stops short of asking what such a realisation might actually look like, but it is the task of academics like yourselves to investigate these attitudes more closely. It is possible that Europeans believe in cooperation, but have trouble supporting a system whose accountability is so challenged. The idea of accountability, the linchpin of public trust, takes on many forms in my case file. Last year, I issued a recommendation in a case for the European Banking Authority, the EBA, had, in my view, wrongly allowed its former executive director to become CEO of a financial lobby association. The public image and consequently public trust risked being damaged by a perceived, if not manifest, conflict of interest. The EBA responded with a pledge that it is prepared to forbid senior staff from taking up certain positions when they leave the EBA in the future. Shortly afterwards, it prohibited its former executive director from taking up another post in the private sector in the City of London. It has also adopted a new policy for assessing post-employment restrictions and prohibitions for staff. Another example concerned complaints about the Commission's awarding of a public contract as regards sustainable finance to BlackRock Investment Management in an area which is of financial and regulatory interest to the company. I concluded that the Commission's guidelines for assessing bid bidders should be revised with a broader and more comprehensive assessment of potential conflicts of interest. These cases also linked the more fundamental question of who is in charge of Europe's financial and economic policy in the coming years. Where does the accountability lie for Europe's recovery and the EU's recovery plan post-pandemic, a point I referenced earlier? How the institutions and member states share out that power is a question of intimacy, and the EU institutions can only do so much to create a responsive and legitimate democracy. The heavy lifting has to be shared with the member states. The roles of the Commission and the Parliament are relatively easy to grasp, but not so the Council. Its structure is not intuitive, its workings are multi-layered, complex and obscure, with lip service paid to its treaty obligation to legislate in public. I recently watched a clip of a Council meeting, ostensibly in public, with a meeting chair desperately trying to sort out the public bits from the non-public bits, and tersely instructing, cameras on, cameras off. The Council's starting position for most legislative documents is that they are not public, despite the fact that the EU treaties, the regulation on access to documents, the case law and common sense suggest that the starting point should be the inverse. It is also difficult to obtain information on what individual member states' positions are. The Court of Justice has ruled that member state positions need to be public if recorded. The Council has effectively subverted the transparency intent of the ruling by simply not recording the positions. This consequently allows national governments to hide behind unanimity and apply the blame Brussels method to accountability. These two issues were subject to my own initiative inquiry I carried out into Council transparency and which ultimately ended up as the report to the European Parliament in 2018. The then Parliament supported, along with many parliaments uh, throughout the Member States, calling for legislative documents to be made public systematically. The Council, however, continues to resist and its opaqueness prevents citizens from knowing exactly who is doing the resisting. But pressure has brought some small changes. The recent German presidency of the Council introduced measures to proactively publish certain progress reports on legislative negotiations. The initial Council mandate at the level of the head of the permanent representations to the EU and the initial positions document ahead of negotiations. The current Portuguese presidency has also made some interesting transparency moves concerning the common agricultural policy. It remains to be seen, however, whether this approach is file specific or whether we will continue to see other such proactive publication. Much of this opaqueness and complexity was obvious fodder for the pro-Brexit movement, whose anti-EU rhetoric continues apace through this crisis, pouncing on any EU misstep as a justification for leaving the Union. 
The COVID crisis has helped partly to obscure the initial fallout from the divorce. And while UK media is filled with laments from business people and others about the bureaucracy and obstacles they now encounter as they at attempt to trade with the bloc, these so far have been dismissed by the UK government as teething problems, or as Michael Gove put it recently, like the bumps one experiences on takeoff before the plane levels off and heads, quite literally, into the sunny uplands. But as sovereignty and taking control are neither edible nor bankable, it may take a while before those benefits are visible, or to form a conclusion as to the extent to which the emotional attachment of many pro-Brexiteers to those intangibles was the real driving force behind the exit. As Nigel Farage said in 2018, I made one absolute promise in that campaign. We will be in control for good or for bad. I never promised it would be a huge success. I never said it would be a failure. I just said we'd be in control. The Financial Times noted last month that the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement mentions financial services 90 times, 90, and fish 368 times. The comparison may be less drastic if one were to search for different combinations of words, but given that fishing accounts for only 0.1% of, of the UK economy, one might conclude that it was the psychodrama around the idea of controlling its own waters that drove that particular piece of asymmetry. As I have said throughout this lecture, accountability is challenging in the EU and complex. As I have also said, this does not mean that the EU does not ultimately manage to live with its contradictions and provide a quality of life and a force in the world that is in the main positive. Brexit was infected with a caricature of those contradictions and of the institutions that attempt to manage them. A toxic, negative view of the EU was essentially internalised, predominantly in England, to the point where its attempted unravelling by the Remain side came too late. In my role as Ombudsman, I occasionally find that some of my investigations are picked up by a Eurosceptic or a Euro-hostile press. I use that fact as a message to the institutions of how important it is for them to operate at a standard of ethics and transparency beyond that even of most of the member states. I've told my colleagues recently that our job, fundamentally, is to help the good guys to stay good. I recently read or reread an article by Dr. Dimitrakopoulos of last April, in which you and your colleagues gave a preliminary assessment of the EU's reaction to the pandemic. In that article, you wrote that after a rocky start, the EU had done much more than meets the eye. In the same article, you suggested that the EU should strengthen its decision-making process in times of crisis to ensure efficiency, speed, and visibility. A strong decision-making process clearly identifies who is taking which decision. Efficient processes have clearly allowed responsibilities, have clearly allocated responsibilities. Speedy decisions are made when ownership of tasks is clear. If the EU is to gain strength through this crisis, its leaders need to show ownership, but they also need to show that ownership at times is shared, that control is exercised through a delicate balancing of forces, which attempts to reflect the multiple ways in which the people accord legitimacy to the lawmakers and decision makers. Only by doing that can true accountability be secured. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was uh, extremely um, useful um, and a very broad range um, uh, of issues have been raised in a way that has generated several questions. So if uh, you don't mind, like I have organized them thematically um, to give you more space to perhaps expand on some of the themes that you have touched upon. Um, and take it from somebody who has been living in the UK for many years. Um, there is the issue of principle. You raised rightly in your uh, speech uh, the point about transparency and accountability. But there is a hell of a lot of uh, cynicism around. 
at the national level primarily and the cynicism even in the form of some postgraduate students at the doorstep transparency doesn't really matter when one campaigns for things how would you respond to that and if i can take this in the direction of two specific institutions because attendees have raised the issue what can be done about the council in your view in terms of improving transparency and what can be done about the euro group um well i, I made the point the word that i use quite frequently in, in my talk there was was about legitimacy um and um i often say to the the, the council and other people that you know you kind of can't have it both ways you can't lament uh, that, that that people are cynical about the decision making or cynical about its legitimacy or cynical about the way certain people are appointed um that you lament that uh, and try to reach out to citizens but the but the the single most important and most appropriate way in which you have to reach out is to tell them what you're doing Tell them what you're up to. Uh, it's extraordinary because, I mean, in in the member states, obviously, in most democracies, a government will set out its legislative programme. We'll know what's on the table. We'll know the arguments that are being made. We know what happens in, in committees and, and so on. We know what the opposition thinks. We'll see amendments being put forward in, in various chambers or committees. But all of that is, is kept um, behind clo closed doors uh, to a great degree uh, in the council. Um, and what I what I say in relation to that is that they have to join the dots. They they have to join the dots between, as you say, increasing cynicism perhaps and and your scepticism, and the way they try and run it. What some might claim to be, which I do not agree with, a sort of elite project for people who understand these big things and not for the little people. Um, and you know when we put our gentle proposals uh, to, to the council, the answer is, well, nothing would get done if, if everything was out there. And I mean, there's, okay, there's, there's a certain, you know, one can understand that on one level when you're trying to get 27 member states to agree on something. Uh, but the, my argument is, well, you know, let's have a bit of political maturity here. Uh, and, you know, People aren't stupid in the main. People understand that in a, in a large family, trying to get everybody to agree on what to have for dinner can be contested. So if you have 27 member states trying to agree on something. But you see, when you, when you delve into it as well, sometimes it, it's not so much that, um, uh, you know, they, they put a, you know, that, that it's, it's sort of, it's a bit like a, it's a diplomatic, uh, maneuver rather than a legislative maneuver and, and people only show their hands in, in certain ways. Um, but very often it seems to me what, what they're trying to, to obscure is the deals that are done between, between member states. You know, so let's say Ireland might have a particular interest in a particular issue, let's say in agriculture, it gets France and Greece and Italy on, on board and in return it, it says, look, I'll help you on something else. Now, the something else might be something that the Irish people aren't in favour of, so that has to be kept, you know, slightly off the table. But, but if, on the one hand, you know, the, the heads of the institutions want to say that there is accountability, there is legitimacy in the way that there is in, 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 most, in, in the member states, then they have to demonstrate that by a very simple thing of allowing citizens to know what's going on. What are you talking about? What are, what are you trying to decide? What are the arguments? Who's in, who's in favour? Who's against? It actually is worth looking at that clip that I referenced um, during the Finnish presidency. And there is a meeting of the, of the, of the council at the end of the line when the proposal, proposals are, are going to be voted on or agreed or whatever. And all the poor woman can concentrate on are the cameras. This is a public bit. Okay, cameras on, cameras off, cameras on, cameras off. And it, it, in that tiny clip, it, it just, I will say, it gave the game away, sounds, sounds a bit glib. But I think that what the council has to do, I mean, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between um, efficiency, perhaps, and legitimacy. 
but um, legitimacy has to has to trump everything and legitimacy will be given only if the people are given allowed to exercise their democratic right under the treaties to take part in, in the decision making process it's it's a slow slow road i mean we have made some progress but I, as i often say when you have difficult things to get across the line you need a coalition of forces so i do my bit various member state parliaments do their bit academics like you write and and, and influence and so on um, but 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 things are changing and just the the transparency piece i mean it's it's interesting in relation to the vaccine contracts suddenly the commission found it was in its interest to be transparent when it was having a row with astrazeneca and suddenly they saw a political problem in not getting sufficient vaccines for the for the european population and then it was let's have transparency you know uh, as i said at one point madame von der leyen seemed to be you know quoting my best lines in relation to transparency so one can become a little bit bit cynical there um but yeah so i i think opening up the council and having people you know deal with the reality of the messiness of, of trying to resolve something at least then people feel that they have skin in the game if you like that that they are being treated actually as citizens one additional co question that relates to european institutions before we look at the, dom the national dimension because quite a lot of the questions relate to the national dimension your line which i share on a personal basis completely is that the council is a legislator legislators act in the public interest or should act in the public interest hence transparency what is your view of the role of the european commission as an institution of the eu that makes you say we want more transparency from the commission as well is there what is your understanding of what the commission is meant to be within the eu that makes you say more transparency please well i mean it is it is the, the executive body it has the most contact with with the citizens you know and the regulatory agencies and, and all of that are controlled by the commission so i mean most of our the vast majority of our the complaints that we get are, are about the commission um you know so so therefore and it's not that it's it's poor in terms of its administration no. but it just shows it, it's the big beast in in the jungle um and i mean if only for that reason it, it needs to be transparent in relation to what it does but you see when you say that the role of the commission i mean you know when, when i when i came to europe you've always been in europe um when i became ombudsman in 2013 and you know you're trying to figure out the the, the you know the, the the politics and the interinstitutional uh, positioning and so on and as i said in my piece well you, you take it that you know it's the council you know has the big plan the big strategy and then the commission finds laws and proposes laws that will fit in with that strategy and then the council and the european parliament legislate together but then you know you you have you have the commission as i said saying very self-consciously you know, very you know publicly we're a political commission um i don't know what that means uh, and younger said it as well we are a political commission so but if you're just taking kind of the orders from the council and you're just executing the policies then then how are you a political commission so in a way it's sort of it it is and and it isn't uh, in, in terms of how it acts, and I can only go. I'm, I'm not. I'm not an expert in European affairs. I, I see everything through the prism of, of my role as ombudsman and through the complaints that I get. So I have to evaluate it like that. Uh, you know. So, so on, on the one hand, you have the Commission making the big State of the Union addresses, for example, which came in a few years ago. You know, they're the ones doing the State of the Union. You know, setting out the policy priorities for the. Uh, for, the, for, for the next few years or even longer in the term in terms of climate change and issues like that. So anybody looking at that would think, oh, well, that's the government. And they're, they're sort of deciding on, on the laws and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, you know, when things get hot, you realize that actually, no, it's not quite like that because it's, it's the council, it's the member states who are really you know um uh, running the show so you know i, I mentioned that two-part documentary which is really worth watching i don't know if you've seen it and it's fascinating i mean it claims to be a fly in the wall but obviously the council was in control of, of what i was seeing 
But there you saw that, you know, in terms of the COVID fund, I mean, that, that was negotiated and agreed, you know, by, 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 by the European Council, you know, um, not by the Commission, even though the Commission subsequently came out and said, we've got all this money and, and, and so on, and bravo, because it was a very difficult thing, thing to do. So now you have the Commission, you know, this week, seeing that even though the heads of state have, um, uh, the heads of state have endorsed it, the parliaments have to do it as well. So, you know, uh, it's difficult. But to get back to your question about the Commission on Transparency, yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, they, they are probably have the most direct contact with, with, with people's lives, you know, in terms of, in terms of everything from, from, you know, the regulation, from contracts, procurement, um, uh, uh, you know, all of those, uh, all of those issues that they, that they deal with. And so therefore transparency has to be a very high value uh, for them. Thank you. Um, we have other questions about the European Union level, but there are uh, members in the audience who know a lot about the domestic side of transparency and the need for transparency. So we have a few questions uh, in relation to that. My colleague Ben Worthy, who has written extensively on freedom of information, reminds us that, and I should have said that in the beginning, that prior to becoming the European Ombudsman, you were information commissioner in Ireland. So yeah. one question is, is there a difference between the two settings and your own role um, and the challenges that come with these two different roles? And another there question is, that relates to the national level, uh, if I may uh, add, is this, uh, a member of the audience says, we hear that freedom of information requests are increasingly rejected in the UK. Uh, particularly under the current government and that getting information has become harder. The question is, what is your a sense of the tre trend across the EU? And an additional question to that, is there a difference between East and West in your experience? Yeah, they're very good questions. Just in terms of, of my role as information commissioner and, and my role now in relation to, you know, releasing uh, documents. When in Ireland, I was separately ombudsman under one statute and freedom of information commissioner under another statute. So as ombudsman, I made rec non-binding recommendations. As information commissioner, I made binding decisions. So in other words, if I recommended that the Department of Finance, if I said that the Department of Finance should release certain documents, it had to release them or take me to court. Okay, so in in the EU, um, that that sort of review role that the Ombudsman has is still in the area of non-binding recommendations. And my experience has been that if they don't want to release a document, they simply won't. Even if the chances are that if they went to the ECJ, the document would be released. They rely on the fact that the vast majority of people will not go to the ECJ and therefore they don't have to they don't have to release. Now, I, I have sort of, I've talked sort of quietly about that I think there should be that kind of independent information commissioner in the EU system, because otherwise it's the institutions who control the town. They decide lots of information, no information. I mean, you know, take that point about the, the vaccine contracts. I mean, the reason that the complaints had come to us in the first instance is because the commission had refused to release uh, you know, so so we're sorting all this out, and then in the middle of this, they have the row with AstraZeneca, and suddenly, oh my God, we have to have transparency. They control that. You know, I'd like to think it was my intervention that led to some partial release of, of, of documents. It wasn't. It was it was political pressure. They were feeling the heat, and they had to do that. I've been reading, uh, as you say, in the UK that. Um, uh, yeah, that, that interests me a lot because obviously you have the, the information commissioner system there and you have tribunals as well. And I'm, I'm just wondering what's happening. I mean, if, if somebody tries to access a document and they don't get it and they go to the information commissioner, then and the information commissioner says, well, release. I, I'm, I'm just I'm just I haven't studied it sufficiently to know where the blockages are, but I know in general, from my experience now, this sort of nearly 18 years as an ombudsman, 10 years as an information commissioner, so, or, or sorry, with, with binding powers, administrations do not like transparency. They do not like FOI regimes. Uh, you will possibly have read Tony Blair's book in which he said something which many people might disagree with, that the worst decision he ever made was to introduce the, the FOI Act. 
you know. So, but I, I think I think it's interesting, and and I think that um, uh, yeah, the, the UK said as for as for other uh, member states, well, typically you have you see that's you know when when you become almost when in the European sense, you, you go in with your own sort of. Uh, I don't know, what would you call it, your own cultural attitudes towards even administrative things, like transparency, data protection, you know, conflicts of interest, revolving doors. Um, and then what you're dealing with is everybody else's cultural experience of those. So typically the Nordics would be, yes, everything's transparent and, you know, other countries, no, data protection would be, would be, a, would be a, a high value. But also things like conflicts of interest and revolving doors. I mean, in some countries, even in some member states, for a politician to exit one and then go straight into the private sector without any constraint would just be, you know, no big deal. So that is what you're dealing with. So I don't know. But then again, I mean, I've, I've often reflected as well that transparency is only a tool. And it's what happens when something is made transparent that is, that is the most important thing. I mean, I've often said about Donald Trump that he was the most transparent president or candidate ever. We all knew his racism, his sexism, his misogyny, his tax affairs, his this, that and the other. And OK, he lost the election, but a hell of a lot of people still voted for him. So, I mean, I think that is the scary thing. And I've noticed it in some countries, even if I may say in, in, in the UK, where there have been various scandals, you know, of a minor to major kind affecting politicians over a number of years. And I know that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, that would, that would have been the end of their careers. But it seems that there isn't as much that is career ending in relation to politics as previously. And I, I think that is important um, because so, you know, uh, an ombudsman or, or a journalist or somebody exposes an element of whether it's corruption or lack of integrity or something and they think there it is that's it nobody denies the facts and then nada <laughs> you know and and that's that's what's scary so transparency has its limits transparency i mean i, I remember one of the one of the big whistleblowers not snowden who's the other guy who's in the in the embassy um please come on somebody help me here um, WikiLeaks. I'm happy with. Thank you, Julian Assange. Thank you, Ali Palmer. Um, uh, Julian Assange. Yes, I, I remember it was it was either he or maybe uh, Snowden who, when they exposed awful atrocities and so on, and to the public gaze with you know, civilians being effectively murdered, you know, in, in uh, by certain armies and, and so on, atrocities happening in, in various wars that were been uh, that were being conducted. And, and they sat back and, and thought, OK, now let's let's wait for, for change. And they were surprised when when change didn't happen. And I think in a way, um, the culture wars, so-called, that we're all experiencing now in, in, in many countries, sort of are, are part of that and and you know one, one of the one of the most sort of discombobulating things about the experience of, of, of Trump and and also certain things in other countries including in, in 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 Europe you know bad things happen bad things are done and with a single sentence uh, they can be dismissed by the perpetrators whether it's the government or a prime minister or whoever and and then and then nothing happens so you know we're moving into you know in the 90s foi transparency was was the was the you know the, the magic uh, wand if you like um but we have a lot of transparency still uh, but it's what happens when things are made transparent that, uh, that, 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 that can be a worry. But nonetheless, the UK, what's happening there is very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. A couple of additional questions that relate to European institutions. Uh, one from a colleague from City Law School who asks, does the EU Ombudsman have too few powers in international relative to its work and does the reach of EU external relations law warrant a more realistic view of openness and transparency? And another question again about the EU level. What is your experience in dealing with the cases on EU borders, for example, complaints against Frontex? 
Okay. Um, it's a tough just, audience. Yeah, in, in, in relation to more powers, um, I, I often think that the, the weaker the powers of an ombudsman are, the stronger the administration is. If you have a strong and good administration, then you do not need an ombudsman with strong coercive powers to make you do anything. You should be doing those things because that's what a good administration does. So in Europe, generally speaking, the more established EU states or democracies, however you want to characterize them, they tend to have ombudsmen with relatively weak powers, so-called, but who are very effective. The ombudsman says, do this, or says jump, and they say how high, and they do it. In other states where they have come from a tradition where the rule of law wasn't yet settled, they have given the ombudsman stronger powers, uh, such as making cases before the constitutional court and, and you know, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the ombudsman can actually be weakened by the administration just doesn't listen to them, ignores them. Um, you know, that's the, that's the problem. I mean, I, I know this sounds a bit glib, uh, but I, I have, after all of my years of experience as ombudsman, an ombudsman institution works when everybody agrees to play the game. When the ombudsman, you know, conducts herself or himself ethically, independently, efficiently, all of that, and then the administration plays its game by acceding to the ombudsman's recommendations, um, unless they are really you know, uh, uh, ridiculous, um, because that is an acknowledgement of the value of this role of the independent watchdog in, in an administration for the sake of the citizen and so on. So I know brilliant ombudsmen, you know, geniuses, loads of empathy, lots of political news, all of that, but who are in countries that do not like ombudsmen, <laughs> that do not have a strong uh, love of, of, of the rule of law and democracy, and, and therefore, no matter who you are, or what, what, what powers you have, um, you can still be dismissed. Therefore, in the EU, um, the strength of the ombudsman, obviously, you know, it, it helps if you kind of know yourself and are, you know, show your independence and all of that. But really, you are as strong to a certain extent as the administration allows you to be strong. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, do I want, well, if I think if I had, no, I don't particularly, no, I don't want more powers. I mean, I think there is an issue around uh, the, the transparency and, and, and FOI, because I think there is, there is a structural uh, problem there. But the day that I have more powers, or that they choose to give the Ombudsman more powers, is the day when we can say that the EU administration is in trouble. Uh, there, there were, there were two other questions, a couple of other questions there. Um, yes, one question was about differences between East and West uh, uh, that I have noticed. Um, and uh, from your experience, do you feel there is an East-West divide in regards to the types of issues raised as well as attitudes to the EU in general? Um, I, I think, I think that there, there can be. Uh, obviously, at, at, at the moment, um, you know, countries such as Poland or, or Hungary are, are having, let's see, conversations with the EU institutions, with, with, with the Commission, and even amongst themselves and the Council in relation to issues around freedom of the press, independence of the judiciary, um, all of that. Now, you know, when when you, so how 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 that would come to my desk? I mean, that would never come as an issue directly to me, but only if, let's say, an infringement case was taken against a certain country because it was feeling that there was, there was a breach of the Charter of Fundamental Rights or the Rule of Law or something like that. I wouldn't look at the actual breach. I wouldn't look at and examine what the government was doing in relation to the media. But I would look at how the Commission had responded to that mm -hmm. allegation of a breach. So, so that's, that is where, where I can look. But I, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes the Western Europe 
compared to sea itself, it's a little more saintly than it possibly is, you know. So, um, uh, you know, there, there can be what, what you might call what about me. And, and this is why when, you know, you mentioned the, the, the Selmar uh, case, or but also be, before that, this was the former president of the commission who went off to go with Sachs and so on. Um, you know, that's that's what I mean. When, when things like that happen, I mean, they're not they're not high crimes and misdemeanors, but they, they give a, a, a negative impression and they, they feed the beast in terms of, you know, uh, Euro skepticism and, and, uh, and, and hostility towards the union. And that's why I often say, even though it seems like a big ask, the EU has to have standards that are really, really high uh, because, and, and, you know, also, it, you know, it, it can be, such a global force in terms of its soft law influence and in terms of those issues that we're talking about. So if that gets, gets if the administration itself gets to those high standards, then it will have a right to let your others in, in relation to breaches. The two specific questions that were asked, one relates to your experience in dealing with the cases on EU borders and fraud. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, the, the other one yeah. relates to yeah. uh, uh, the EU Ombudsman's uh, powers in international relations uh, relative to its what does the reach of EU external relations law war a more realistic view of openness and transparency, is the question. Okay, uh, well, in relation to, to Frontex, first um, report that I took to Parliament, which is following on from, from the work of my predecessor, Professor Diamandouros, uh, concerned um, Frontex and uh, uh, our insistence that it should have a, a functioning complaints mechanism. Um, now, uh, recently we, we started looking again at Frontex. We have had complaints um, in, in relation to certain allegations, uh, pushbacks and so on. Um, uh, and we are we are examining that at the moment. I mean, it's under a lot of scrutiny. I, I just read today that the European Parliament has has formed a committee to look at Frontex, and OLAF, the European Anti Fraud Agency, is also looking at Frontex. So it's much scrutinised. But in a way, as I was saying to a colleague today, I mean, Frontex also, in a sense, confronts the EU with its own contradictions. Um, you, you have an agency that. On the one hand, it's there to you know, keep the borders safe and stop people coming into uh, Europe that shouldn't be coming into Europe. But on the other hand, it, it, as any EU agency, it is bound to uphold the highest values of the treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And um, the, the head of Frontex, Mr. Legere, was, was interviewed, and I'm just going from the quoted uh, report, so I, I, mean, I don't have this first time as such recently, and, and he point, uh, you know, in relation to what, what people think Frontex is, what is it supposed to be? Um, well, it's supposed to be an EU agency that respects EU laws, values and so on. But, but when you have an agency which, as you know, has been given significantly increased budget, significantly increased resources, 10,000 border guards, I mean, it's obvious that issues around fundamental rights are going to arise. Um, so the, the role of, of, of my role and, and Parliament's role and those who, who, are, who seek to uphold the value to make sure that the fundamental right part is given the same value as, as other parts of its operation. But, you know, there, there, is, there is a big work because I think it's almost as if people have woken up to the fact that, you know, Frontex is suddenly becoming a, a huge deal with uh, you know, implications of that. I didn't quite understand the, 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 the last question. Would you, would you just repeat that again? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not hearing. The most overused term, you are muted. I was muted, sorry. The question comes from a legal academic. A colleague at the uh, City Law School who asks this Does the European Ombudsman have too few powers in international relations relative to its work? 
does the reach of EU external relations law warrant a more realistic view of openness and transparency? Is this, she says, organically happening relative to the work of the Ombudsman beyond the treaty's strict, strict wording, for example, work on TTIP, EU-Turkey relations and so on? That's the question. Mm -hmm. No, my, my mandate is, is, is absolutely limited to, to the institutions and, and, uh, and, and, not, and not the member states. Um, uh, so, I mean, I do chair a, a network of, of uh, national ombudsmen. Of course, a lot of these, of these issues are discussed and, and, and so on. But no, but the mandate is, is limited to that. I mean, wh when, it was being, um, when it was being created back in the 1990s, there was talk of having sort of a an ombudsman office in, in, in all of the member states, you know, but anyway, that, that didn't emerge and, and what emerged um, is, is the office that I currently hold. But no, it's, it's, it's quite limited. It, it is limited and constrained in relation to that. I mean, the Petty Committee, the Petitions Committee in the EU, now they can deal with, they get petitions from the member states in relation to matters that cross border issues and all of that. Um, and, and, and issues that are that are specific to to member states, um, but that they are completely outside outside of my remit. Yes, I see no other novel questions that have not been uh, asked uh, and answers. It's almost uh, 7:30 in the UK, 8:30 in Brussels uh, and Strasbourg. Uh, I think we have uh, all enjoyed a very um, productive, very stimulating and challenging uh, inaugural lecture. We normally ask the audience to keep uh, themselves, to keep the microphones off, but I think uh, in the interest of showing our appreciation, we can unmute ourselves and applaud um, uh, Emily O'Reilly for this which we all appreciate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.